Um, today is not so much about me delivering a certain point, uh, but uh, I wanted to try to uh, offer you a method, okay? A way of thinking that I think can help you through some, uh, some things in your life. And so this is kind of a method-based sermon, more than a point-based sermon, if you'll think of it that way. Um, the, the phrase back here, have you ever said this? Uh, where did that come from? You ever, you ever said that? Where did that come from? Uh, and I don't know when it happened to you, but it's happened to me several times. Uh, you know, maybe it's, for example, um, uh, maybe you did something or maybe you said something that you didn't really prepare to do. You just kind of, you did it and you thought to yourself, huh, well, where did that come from? I, I don't know. Why did I even, why did I even do that? Uh, or uh, maybe uh, you were in a conversation uh, uh, hypothetically with some hunting or fishing buddies uh, and you were tempted and maybe even stretched the truth a little bit. It's called a fishing story for a reason. I don't know why they call them preacher stories, except that they're probably just fabrications. Uh, but if you've ever been tempted and maybe gave in and maybe stretched your story a little bit, you kind of wonder yourself later, what, well, why did I do that? Where did, where did that come from? Um, or maybe you were uh, watching a movie or listening to some music and something about that really touched you and made you maybe more emotional than you really thought you would be. And you thought, wow, I don't know where that came from. I wonder where did that come from? Um, or maybe uh, you're about five foot tall and you're blonde haired and you come home from work one day and, uh, you know, you go into the kitchen and you begin slamming some dishes around and slamming cabinets and your son and your husband hypothetically uh, by the names of Sam and Jacob begin to wonder what they have done wrong uh, and maybe Jacob starts to go up the stairs to avoid mom and, and I stay there going uh, where did that come from and I'm wondering did I do something that I shouldn't have done uh, Jan is uh, wonderful and she tolerates a lot of things but sometimes she can be edgy I'm just going to put that there and walk away from it she's not here to defend herself please don't tell her um uh, so, you know, I, I just, um, I remembered when I was in the middle of the night there, I just kind of, my, my, my brain was going, and I really, I distinctly remember this. When Jacob was about a year and a half old, maybe two years old, we were in Michigan, and we just pulled into our driveway in our little Ford Escort wagon, um, and I, I pulled him out of his car seat, and I, I put him kind of up on the, the, the top of the, the chair there, like Mufasa, you know, the Lion King thing, like something like that. Put him up there. And I remember just saying out loud, how could anyone abandon something as wonderful as this? And I, I thought, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And I, I realized in that moment that I had some, some issues. My, my birth father, he had nothing to do with me. And I, I was looking at my son, kind of wondering, why is it that... That, that I was discarded like I was worthless. And I wondered if that had something to do with me. And I, I had to resolve to myself that it really didn't have anything to do with me, even though it kind of felt like that for, for many years in, in my mind. And, and so I had to ask the question, where did that come from? Because it just kind of, out, out there it went, you know, just kind of out into the, the open. Um, I also was thinking about several years ago, this has been back 20 years ago now, um, I had uh, an experience at a home, uh, what's it called, uh, Office Depot. You remember Office Depot? I don't even know if they have them anymore because we have the internet now. And I don't do that stuff in, in person. But I remember I was at, at Office Depot and I was reaching for a book called Databases for Dummies. Um, I didn't look at John for a reason, but he may have read that book. A lot of us decided we had to learn database stuff like 20 years ago. And I, I don't know what was going on that day with me that made this so, so intense, but as I was reaching, my hand started shaking. And I thought, that's kind of weird. And then I started sweating. And then I started shaking and I thought, okay, th this is it. You know, I was, I'm going to, this is where it's going to happen. I'm going down at the, at the store, you know? And uh, so I did the only reasonable thing that, that a man would do is I staggered out of the uh, store through the parking lot, got in my truck and drove myself to the hospital um, while calling Jan on the way saying, I think that this, something bad is happening here. And I had to pull over three or four times, but I got there and I staggered from the back of a vehicle, each one all the way into the emergency room and handed the lady my wallet and said, I don't know what's happening here, uh, but I think I need some help. And I, I said, I'm about to collapse. And they put me in a little gurney and wheeled me back. And I, I had a panic attack that day. And my doctor asked me, he said, what's been going on in your life, Sam, that caused you to maybe have some undue stress or something like that? Where did that come from was his question. 
And as I analyzed what was going on in my life, I started discovering that I'd been drinking approximately three to four gallons of coffee a day. I might be understating that a little bit. Um, and I had a lot of stress. I had a lot of people that were having some sin problems in the church at the time that were calling me in the middle of the night and threatening each other. It was, it was, a, it was a disaster of a time. And I wasn't getting sleep. And I was trying to raise a young family. And I had two jobs. And, and it was, it was a, I was a wreck. And the doctor said, you need to fix that. You need to examine your life, Sam, and make some changes. And so, so I made those changes and haven't had a problem since. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm telling you all these stories and giving you all these thoughts to let you think about that for a second there. Where did that come from? If there's a behavior in your life and you're starting to think to yourself, I don't know why I'm doing this. Where does that come from? And I think that there's a method that, that can help you deal with that. Now, this is one of the times I'm going to ask you, if you would, to just take some notes. You know, to act like you're typing them in your phone for me so I feel like you're following along or write them down so I feel like you're, you're paying attention. Uh, it's not that complicated, but it's four things that I think really help us kind of reorient ourselves towards doing the things that we should be doing versus the things that we are doing. And it looks something like this, that we should uh, ask this question, where did that come from? That's the very first thing. The second thing, identify where that thing came from. I've done that in a couple of my stories already. I went back and I, I identified that there was something in the past that has caused me to do the things I'm doing in the present. There's something that was going on. So ask, identify, learn. Okay, so that's an important thing. Just because you identify the problem doesn't mean you've learned anything at all. We need to learn from what is going on. And then finally, we need to decide. Okay, decide. And so we're going we're gonna to ask. Uh, we're going to identify. We're going to learn. And then we're going to decide how we're going to proceed. Um, and I think that that's a, a method that helps us turn things away from just doing things that we've always done or falling into patterns that are easier than acting in the ways that are consistent with our faith or consistent with the example of Jesus. Um, I think that this helps with a lot of things, not just personal problems and things like that, but with some, some uh, faith problems or with some other biblical questions that we have. For, for example, um, uh, where does temptation come from? Where does temptation come from? Well, you can read your Bible, you can look up uh, in your Bible apps temptation, and you can find the way that temptation works. One of the passages you'll find is in James chapter 1, about verse 13, where he says that, that we should never say that we are tempted or, uh, by, by something else, but we are tempt, or tempted by God, but that we are tempted when we are carried away and enticed by our own evil desires. And when those evil desires um, are acted upon, they give birth to sin, which brings forth death. Okay? And what he just did there was he helped me understand that when I'm tempted, where did that come from? And I could go back and I could say, well, maybe the devil made me do it. Or maybe, well, if, if I had a better wife or if I had a better husband or if I had better children, if they were smarter and better looking, I wouldn't have these problems in my life. Whatever we're doing, like we could always point somewhere else. But the Bible really makes it very clear to us that temptation comes from you, right? Because you entice an idea long enough to act upon it, and when you act upon it, it becomes a sin that leads to death. And he's talking about spiritual death in that context. Do you see how asking a question, where did that come from, could be answered with the, with the scriptures? Or for example, where does fear come from? Where does fear come from? Uh, well, we can answer that practically. I think it comes from common sense in some ways. Uh, there are some things in this world that you should be afraid of, right? Uh, uh, there are lots of things in this world that you should have some fear about, and you should have learned those things when you were a small child and you're growing up to have these natural inclinations, inclinations uh, to be afraid of things that could harm you, okay? And that's something that you should learn. Um, you know, but, but when it comes to fear, uh, the Bible actually has some other things to say about that. For example, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is walking on the water towards the disciples. And at first, what are they? You remember? They're afraid. And as they're afraid, they think they've seen a ghost. And if you'd seen a ghost, you'd probably be afraid also. Like, this isn't normal. This is something out of the ordinary. Something is walking on the water. Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's I. And as he begins to approach, Peter is the one that wants to come out on the water and walk with him. And remember what Peter does. He focuses on Jesus and he's on the water. And then the winds and the waves, they distract him. And what does he do? He begins to sink, right? He falls into the water. And what does Jesus assess that? Remember how he assessed that? He said, oh, ye of little faith. 
Sometimes uh, we can say from the Bible very clearly, our fear comes from a lack of faith. And I can see how I can answer a question by saying, hey, where did that come from? Where are my fears coming from? I can identify where they're coming from. I can decide to be a person of faith and to trust God, and I can move forward and, and do those things. Does that make sense to you? I'm just trying to make sure that we're getting the point, okay? Um, uh, so, you know, where does temptation come? Where does fear come from? We could do this all day. We could pick all kinds of problems and we could go to the Bible and say, what's the Bible say about it? And we can ask, we can identify, we can learn, and then we can decide to move on in a different way. Um, so maybe just one more thing. Sometimes in this process, you might find something that is a little bit different. For example, fear doesn't always come from something uh, that, you, that you know or come from something natural or necessarily even from a lack of faith. Sometimes fear comes from a misunderstanding. Uh, sometimes I've misunderstood something. Like, for example, if I were living and I was, uh, as one lady was many years ago uh, after one of my sermons, I would preached on God's grace and how we're saved by grace through faith and that there's no amount of working that we could do that could ever earn or merit or, or offer to God enough for us to be saved. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, Sam, are you telling me that for the last 40 years that I've gone to bed afraid every single night that if the Lord were to call upon me to, to be with him, that I would, I would maybe not have done enough, that I was afraid that I was never going to be good enough to be saved. And she said, you mean I've wasted all of those years being afraid? Are you telling me that this morning? I said, yes, I am. And she said, I'm going to sleep really well tonight. And I felt really good about that. Uh, and I hope she did too. She's since passed, but you know, the, the truth is sometimes not understanding something can lead us to a fear that's an that's a unnecessary fear. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 8 in verses 32, he says, uh, as Jesus speaks of himself, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's a, that's a, that's a true thing from the Bible that I think that helps us. Okay, um, okay I'll do one more. Uh, yeah, just one more. Uh, where does evil come from? Where does evil come from? Uh, you know, when you're behaving in an evil way, well, we know that temptation leads to sin and sin leads to death, but where does evil come from? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, uh, the Bible uh, does not say that the money is the root of all evil, okay? But it does say that, the, that money is the root of all sorts of evil. And if you're wondering where evil comes from, it might be the love of money that has led you to have all sorts of evil that's going on in your life. Does that make sense? I mean, you could do this over and over with any kind of problem that you have, and you can, you can learn from it. It seems to me to be a healthy practice for us to go and to, uh, to look into God's Word and to ask this question, where did that come from? And then to move on from there to think about, well, where did that come from? And then to learn what the Bible has to say, and then to decide how we're going to respond to that. Be different now because of what the Bible has taught us. Does that make sense so far? One thumb up. That's it. Just one. Because I got the other half of the sermon on this side. Okay. I told you I had all night, several nights in a row. It's not going to be that bad. All right, so there's a word that, that I want you to, to learn today, and you don't have to memorize this in, in the Greek language, but, but the word is dokimazo. Do, dokimazo. Okay, okay that's, that's, a, that's a word that you don't have to remember, but I paid a lot of money in college to learn that. Um, and it's a Greek word, and the Greek word actually means to examine something, uh, to approve or to prove something. Uh, it means that you want to do something to see fit about something, to make sure that something fits. Uh, or you might want to think of it in terms of testing or examining or learning. Okay, that's, that's, That word is used uh, in several different ways. But the idea about learning, if we're going to ask, if we're going to identify, if we're going to learn, then what does that word actually mean in its context? So this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Read with me. Um, Paul is making one of these usual uh, kind of common things to the Corinthian church where he's using a bit of irony, okay? So don't take everything he says so directly, uh, but he's kind of kind of saying to them uh, kind of in an ironic way that they are trustworthy as apostles and as leaders uh, and that they shouldn't discount their leadership in some way. So as he's reading, as, as he's writing this, he says, this is the third time I am coming to you, verse 1. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have previously said, uh, when present this, uh, the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone, since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you, or, or weak, uh, yeah, uh, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you. Uh, they, they have a problem. There's some people that are opposing Paul and his, his 
uh, leadership and his apostleship. And he's speaking back and pushing back on that. He says, for indeed uh, he, that is Jesus, was crucified because of weakness, um, yet he lives because of the power of God. For we are also weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. Okay, So, so he's, he's making another argument. But verse 5 is where we see this word show up. And it's an important word. He says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, uh, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Christ Jesus is in you unless indeed you fail the test? Uh, what Paul is teaching them to do is to take a look inward, to test themselves, the same exact word, and also to examine themselves. What is he doing? I think he's telling them something like this. When you're exhibiting a behavior or have a thought about something, you should begin to think, where did that come from? You're going to put yourself to that test. Where did that thought come from? Where did that action come from? And if it came from a place that was not in the likeness or the example of Christ, then it came from the wrong place. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and so we have to take the time, he says, to test ourselves and to examine ourselves. And I think we fail in that department. I think sometimes we do stuff when we go, well, that's just the way I am. Uh, you blow up in anger about something that's going on in, in your life and all of a sudden, well, that's just the way I've always been or that's the, way that I, that's the way I grew up or whatever like that. That's not okay. What we need to learn is say that whatever behavior I have that's not consistent with the behavior of Jesus needs to be tested, it needs to be examined, and, 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 and the test is going to make us decide whether or not we have Christ living in us or if we don't. Is Christ a part of my life, and is he filling me and leading me, or is Christ absent from my life? Um, take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 4. I spent all time in this with our teens this morning. Uh, we're not going to go over the whole text here, but I want you to kind of pick up on what he's doing towards the end of chapter 4. Ephesians 4, and you can read verse 17 to the end of the chapter. That'd be good for you, but I want to give you just kind of the idea of what he's doing here. He, he's saying that there's a way to live that's like the Gentiles. Now, uh, the Gentiles is kind of a shorthand way of talking with the people who were not God's people. In his context, it would have been Jews and non-Jews, and non-Jews would have been referred to as Gentiles. Uh, in which case, uh, in terms of ethnicity today, we would say that there are Jews and non-Jews. There are Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews. Um, in the sense that Paul is writing, it would have something like this. There are people who are God's people and people who are not God's people. There are people who are part of uh, the Lord's kingdom, and there are people who are part of the kingdoms of the world. We could contrast that in several different ways. Uh, so when he says that you're not supposed to walk the way the Gentiles walk. He's going to say that for several reasons. That they have useless thinking, uh, that they have hardened hearts, uh, that they're darkened in their understanding. And there's a lot of reasons why people who do not belong to God, who, who have not had the light of Christ shine upon them and change their lives, would live in a different way. Is that, 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 that making sense to you guys? Okay. So he says that to lead you up to a point where in chapter 4, verse 20, he says this, about the behavior of impurity and disobedience and immorality. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And the word learned there is exactly the same word as in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. The idea is you did not uh, learn or you did not examine Christ and reflect that, that examination. You did not follow in the example of Jesus. You did not learn Jesus this way. What you did, though, is you learned a lot of different things from a lot of different other places. Um, when um, I shared this with the teens this morning, but when I was a, a teenage boy, I had two people that were uh, kind of a bad influence in my life in, in one sense. Uh, one was my, my best friend Leonard and the other was my mother. Um, my mom had a, a, a problem with, uh, with bad speech, okay, bad language. Uh, and she grew up that way. I'm not making excuses, but she used a lot of bad language in her household. And my friend Leonard used a lot of bad language. And at about 13 years old, I decided that I would also try using some bad language, right? I learned that and then I copied that in my life. Well, I had to ask myself the question at one point in my life, where did that come from, right? Well, it didn't come from Jesus. It didn't come from the way that I was called to live. And so I had to put away something that I had adopted from somewhere else, right? And what Paul is doing is he's talking about this transformation, this change that we undergo that goes from being our old self 
that was uh, characterized by sin, characterized by idolatry, worshiping something that we could manipulate, or characterized by immorality, something that we could take for ourselves as pleasure. And he says that you did not learn Christ that way. Instead, you've been given this new life in Christ where you've put away the old self and you've embraced the new self, and the new self asks new questions. And one of those new questions would be, where did that come from? I have to go back and think, where did I learn this behavior and how do I now make the change to decide to be different because of who Jesus is in my life? Now, that's not the only place that Paul uses his word learn in this argument. In the next chapter, chapter 5, Paul says that we are to be imitators of God and we're supposed to follow in the example of Christ. That makes a lot of sense to us. We look to God to imitate him. How would we know what God is like? Well, we look at Jesus. Jesus is the the visible image of the invisible God. And so we could see that through him. And we could see that he loved us and that he gave himself up as a sacrifice for us. It's the very first thing he says in chapter 5. He then says that immorality and impurity and greed and any such thing like this and filthy talk and all this sort of of stuff uh, needs to be put away from you. You need to kind of put those things out of your life. And then when he gets to uh, uh, to verse uh, verse 6, I'm going to read this. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Um, He says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are Light in the Lord, walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay, as, as in contrast with immorality, impurity, and greed, we are to be people because of the light of Christ that's in us who live in terms of goodness and righteousness and truth. Um, and then he uses his word and he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Did you catch that? It's the same exact word. Uh, and, and the idea now is in a different tense form, okay? There's learn, like engage this and learn, but then there's this ongoing sense or this present perfect sense where we are trying to learn. And what that's telling us, if we're paying careful attention to what Paul is teaching us, is that there's a process, that there is a process involved in that. Uh, something like growing up and maturing in our faith by going through the process of learning what it is to try to be pleasing to the Lord by the things that we choose to do. Rather than falling into our old habits or embracing or reflecting the darkness that's in the world, we are now called to reflect the light that is in Christ. And we do that as we're trying to learn what is pleasing to God. And what that does for most of us is it kind of lets us know that we aren't there yet. Right? And nor do we have to be there in order to be uh, loved by God or to be liked by God. God loves you perfectly, and he knows that you are in a process. The process is becoming what you've already become in Christ, the saved person that God has already saved you to be. You're still becoming that person that he's already made you. It's a beautiful truth about the scriptures that we have salvation now, and we're already growing up to become what we already have been made in Christ, and that is the saved children of God. Now, uh, a little bit more, uh, he goes on to say at the end of this uh, section here in verse 14, um, he goes on to talk about this light a bit more, and he says, for this reason, he says, awake sleeper, uh, which I I can't quote that for any of you this morning, but if you were sleeping, I would point you out right now. Um, Awake sleeper, he says, and rise from the dead. If anyone here had just died during the service, we'd we'd, uh, try to maybe say that. He says, and he says, what will happen is in Christ will shine Uh, on you. We don't know where that comes from, by the way. It's put in your Bible. It's put in kind of a way that makes it look like it's an Old Testament quote. It might come from Isaiah. It might come from Job. Uh, We're kind of guessing a little bit at that because nothing really quite fits on on this being an exact quote. Could have been an early Christian hymn. Some people have surmised that. But whatever it is, he's trying to say something. He's trying to say to us who are still in the process of learning, right, that we will just stop and we'll ask the question, uh, you know, where did that come from? Why, why do I have this problem in my life? What does the word of God say about that? And as I wake up to the truth of what God has tried to teach me about being like Jesus, well, then the light of Christ is going to shine upon me. And that will be evidence that I am now moving in the direction that God wants me to move in, that I'm reflecting the glory of Christ who is at work in us. All right, just one more, okay? I said, I said we were done earlier, but I'm going to give you just one more. Um, where does salvation come from? Where does salvation come from? There's lots of ways that we could talk about that. Uh, we could say, kind of generally speaking, salvation comes 
from the Lord. Uh, we could say that the, the sending of Jesus to be the sacrifice or the Messiah that would offer his life, salvation comes from God. It does not come from you. Uh, as we said earlier, you can't earn merit or deserve the salvation that God has in store for you or that God has offered to you or that you've received. It's a gift from God. It's a free gift from God and one that we can't earn or deserve or merit or return in payment to pay God for what he's already done for us. That's not how salvation comes to us. Where does salvation come from? Now, I'm probably going to have to um, do another sermon on this. Uh, because I sense that this is becoming more of a problem in our culture. Uh, I think that there have always been people in our culture, in my lifetime I've seen it probably for centuries now, people have tried to do this. Uh, but what they try to do is they try to say things like, Jesus is a pretty good start, but then you need to add something more to Jesus to be saved, right? So it's Jesus plus something else. Uh, or there are people in our current culture that say Jesus was a great teacher and he said a lot of really, really true things. And what the, what's really important is not that Jesus was really the Son of God, but that what he represented was something like the Son of God and what he taught was really truth. And you really don't need Jesus to actually be who he claimed to be, the Son of God. All you really need to do is believe that Jesus was a good teacher and that he taught really true things. And that's really going to give you salvation from the bad life that you're having. Do you see what just happened there? We just removed all of the power of, of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus with that one idea. Uh, the other idea is that, well, you, you can believe in the idea of God, right? You, you don't have to believe that there is a God. You just have to believe in the idea of God. And if you do that, your life will be better. It'll be better than all the other ways that are out there. That thinking has been around for centuries. And what they do is what Paul says at one point where he says that they provide a form of godliness. But what do they do? They deny its power. They empty it of all its power. Here is where salvation comes from. Romans chapter 5. Read this with me. Um, I, for one, am not willing to buy what the world is telling us about salvation. Uh, salvation is not just that Jesus was a good teacher and a good idea and taught a lot of good things. Uh, and God is not just an idea that makes your life better. I believe that Jesus was a real person and that God really exists. And that salvation comes only because of those two things that are absolutely and totally true. So what Paul is going to do is this. He says in verse 6, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. He says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Where does salvation come from? It comes from the sacrifice of Jesus. Christ dies for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love. Who? God does that. You see, Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice, a real sacrifice of God who became flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten Son of God who offers himself in our place and the real and true and living God who sent him to die in our place. He goes on to say, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Where does our salvation come from? Salvation comes through the death of the only begotten son of God and the love of the true and the living God. That's where it comes from. Um, when we're asking questions like this, we want to ask the question, where did that come from? We want to identify where it came from, learn from it, and then decide to act accordingly. Let's pray together. Holy God, we ask that you would uh, be with us as we uh, live this week, uh, that we would take into consideration uh, the motivations for our actions and for our words, um, that we would take into consideration the uh, root of the thoughts that we have, that we would look, Father, deeply into your word to find what truth is, that we would examine ourselves carefully in light of that truth, and that we would choose to be like your son Jesus and choose to live the way that you have called us to live in this world, not only for our own preservation, but for your glory and for your honor. Father, we ask that you bless us now as we continue on in, in worship. We thank you, Father, for this time that we spend together every week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.